and uh, con uh, will be by dr suresh sir so first of all we'll start with the pro so yes i have another name i go by another name dr vajrapu uh, so this is the bouncer that rajendra threw to the person speaking con so you will get to see somebody else speaking it so this is uh, about less is more in biomarkers pro in the sense that means that i would be talking about yeah we shouldn't be doing too many of these don't depend much on the biomarkers don't run through that is the pro concept in this don't run behind a lot of uh, doing all these tests about biomarkers and don't rely them on them absolutely because there are hundreds of them when you look at the biomarkers that are available at this point of time in for cns we talk about neuron specific nlas yes hundreds the metal of proteins the you know all those stems and all those things. delirium for example something just as simple as to understand whether the patient is delirious or not you could look at the patient but no we would want to make sure that the patient has really a delirium you send about all this look at biomarkers adiponectin brain protein tau proteins right so all these ards yeah we discussed i told you about all the proteomics that uh, will define will probably you can follow to differentiate and put them onto a particular subclass. So there are a lot of them, the s rays the PAI, the TNF, the V, WF, IL-6, IL-8. Sepsis, we have seen through them, protein C, CRPs, procalcitonin, and estrums. A lot of biomarkers are there to tell you that, yes, probably it is an infection. Acute kidney injury, yes, NGAL, KIM-1, Cystatin, now pre-enkephalin, new something else coming up, urine microRNA, a lot of th these things again. You would have heard, you would have gone through research. Again, and simple tests, such as your routine CBP would give you about leukocytes, lymphocytes. You look at leukocytosis and say, oh, this patient has fever. Or you look at it and you look at fever. A patient might have fever. A patient might have, you know, shock. You don't need a TLC to tell you that the patient has got an infection. Right? So patient, you look at TLC and then it won't tell you whether the patient has actually an infection. The leukocytes are high. It doesn't mean that there's an infection. It could be something else also. So in that sense, there are a lot of these biomarkers that you're running around with. Cytokines, chemokines, all those things. But when you say an ideal biomarker, what's an ideal biomarker? It has to have high sensitivity, high specificity. It should be useful for your clinical applications in the diagnosis, staging, prognosis, and treatment of the disease. It should be widely available at an affordable cost and quick, and it should yield an accurate result. But in recent years, what we have seen is this biomarker use is increased exponentially, like the list that I gave you. Around 180 biomarkers have been evaluated in sepsis, but none of which have given you some sort of a con you know, convincing data. So four questions that are asked before startup and any sending a biomarker or you send off or you start looking at sending any biomarker is what is the pretest probability? Is it going to be some, you know, is it going to be sensitive enough or specific enough? And would it be, uh, would it be there any factor that would interfere with such interpretation of these result? Will I change management based on the result? What will be the outcome benefit? So these answers to these questions are not there because you see when I go the rounds and some of my residents would have sent a drop I pro BNP uh, the question is, why are you sending them? What are you do looking for? If the patient is a clear-cut failure patient, everybody can make out you have got a step. If you put a step, actually, you would listen to the ray as the patient is a known case of uh, LV dysfunction. You has got an acute decomposite heart failure. He's got effusions everywhere. He's got a pulmonary edema. And still, you want to put a probe BNP on him just to start LASIX or not. That is that is not going to be, or put him on an IV. That, that is, a, that is that what you are waiting for? for the probe and P report to come in. And a lot of people ask me in COVID, oh, the troponin I is huge. Oh, troponin is, is elevated. I said, why are you sending trop I? What are you going to do with the trop I? Is it going to give you any yield or are you going to act upon it? Yeah, troponin is 5,000. Are you going to do something? Or troponin is 50. Are you going to do something? Maybe it's only going to scare you up when you don't know what to do with those results. It is something akin to what people thought initially in sepsis. Uh, you put a PA cat and you don't know what to do with it, whatever numbers come out, if you don't apply them in use, it is not going to be used. Same way, if unless and until you know what you're going to do, don't send a test, don't run behind it. It's the same thing with biomarkers. A lot of biomarkers that people send just because they can send, it doesn't mean that it's going to make a difference to your management or to the patient or to you, except for financial burden of the patient. 
critical illness and biomarkers we all know we have seen that rds and sepsis are heterogeneous you cannot run behind one product and one biomarker and say this biomarker will tell me what will happen in sepsis or what will happen in ards but it's not like an mi which is a simple homogeneous state but then etiopathology is different like we have talked about ards recently just before the present lecture it's it's completely heterogeneous and then running behind some one or two pro, you know biomarkers to define the etiopathogenesis or to give you a meaningful uh, outcome is 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 just full full hardy crp for example some of these which have been time bound which have been there for years together but we still don't know whether it is sensitive it's not spe sensitive or specific enough to tell you that there's an infection do you we might do this because it's a cheap test you keep doing it procalcitonin the cut off value in my hospital the procalcitonin cost 7000 rupees i would be skeptical in sending a procalcitonin unless and until it does really you are in a perplexing position where you would actually want it but i don't see that kind of situation anywhere because there are 28 studies who have which have been done on procalcitonin and they have no such reason to recommend a threshold value which says that there is yeah under this cut off value it is non infective or above this value it is infective so that is something that is there procalcitonin again they you know, look at it antibiotic exposure somebody would say that yeah probably procalcitonin would help me in cutting down the days of antibiotic but no studies have actually demonstrated any difference in mortality length of stay or recurrent infection this is an analysis uh, on done in canada because of canadian dollars and they said that it doesn't decrease anything the cost of the antibiotics or the administration cost of the iv antibiotics or the procal testing costing or any assay material or the technological people who are involved in doing the test or behind those lab analysis so nothing of this is reduced by using procalcitonin and what about de escalation can we do a procalcitonin use de escalation the average reduction in the icu trials is only 1 to 1 and a half days and that is based on a meta analysis for the sequential analysis there are a lot of limitations again we have to understand that you have to not do one point if you want to change your antibody de escalate based on procalcitonin you have to do it multiple times and doesn't have a sufficient positive predictive value it can be false elevated in a lot of conditions in such as an acute kidney injury procalcitonin guidance again for antibiotic usage reduction using procalcitonin may be promising but then not much of data all that data that is coming out is from only from respiratory tract infections and that in emergency department it has never been done in the icu per se to kind of extrapolate in your icu so there are not much of icu studies as far as this is concerned and the guidelines the ers guidelines the asicm asmid alert guidelines all for those that die, doesn't help you in diagnosing wap in the icu so that is where we are looking for it doesn't help you there what about surviving sepsis guideline the latest one 2021 doesn't even recommend procalcitonin to be used for deciding on your antimicrobials so that's not great enough and what about the other some was this is one more study wap rapid 2 study there are a lot of uh, bal done interleukin 1 beta interleukin 8 could it actually predict us to tell us whether the patient has a wap it doesn't help any that this is a multi center randomized control trial which has got 24 different icus participating uh, across 17 nhs trust but then they said that antibiotic use remains high despite the fact that you know patients uh, you do all these interleukin 18 and other studies to tell whether the patient has got a wap or not so many times we see any patient with covid patient comes they send all those tests counts are normal everything is normal ct scan is showing covid still they will put antibiotic and they will send procalcitonin is negative still they put antibiotic what is the point of doing the procalcitonin there if you are still going ahead and doing putting your antibiotic there antiprobian pain tropis like i said yeah everybody is calling me and said covid uh, we have seen lot of tropi what to do yeah in mi patients yeah you can understand the patient has got a troponin i elevated the subset of patients probably yes sepsis everybody has got a global elevated dysfunction tropi is elevated then the cardiologist would say oh this is probably because the patient is female the tropi is elevated or somebody would say it's not elevated because it's a female or somebody would say it is because the renal failure the tropi is elevated so there are lot of things that would come into the picture they would change that number based upon their own inference they would not look at it and say let's do this they, i would say push the patient for an it looks like an ischemia please do an angio the cardiologist would say let's send a tropi once a tropi comes as elevated he would say no this is because the renal failure is a tropi is elevated let's go conservative manner let's not do intervention that's the kind of a problem that we are dealing with because these are numbers that are selected to just find and most of the biomarkers are basically a subsequence 
of an event. They are not going to tell you to prevent the event. Most of them are a product something like a metabolite. In the sense, lactate, right? They are after an event has happened. You know, it can reduction, clearance may probably may help you out. But then once you look at lactate, uh, it's not going to change your treatment or the guidance or these biomarkers are not going to change that treatment because you have to prevent the actual event from happening. For example, acute kidney injury. There are so many variables for acute kidney injury. There are cystatin, sangal and everything you would say. It predicts AKI by few hours, few days, but then none of the interventions have prevented them from patients from going into AKI. So that's why you don't see an NGAL study. Nobody does them uh, outside the research perspective into the clinics. So super, again, one more uh, super new, proca new procastone, I would say the new procastone or something, where you would look at the soluble urokinase uh, type plasminogen activator again receptor. From stem cell transplantation patient to asymptomatic aortic stenosis, everybody has got elevated super. They have a higher super levels. So it doesn't mean that. So what are the findings based upon this? It is not clear about that. And emergency department, one trial was done using super to aid risk stratification. Foam should be going into the ICU, should not be, but did not change the outcomes. And 79% or 80% almost of physicians who were asked about this super, they said that their decision was not influenced by this, only in around 10% of cases, or they did not. So what is the point of doing such kind of thing? AKI and NGAL, like I said, there was a meta-analysis by Hortol, which included 16 studies, 2,900 patients, urine NGAL as a biomarker of prediction of AKI after cardiac surgery in adult patients. The area under the curve, the ROC curve, was less than 80. 0.8, it was 0 0.72, so it doesn't help you, that clearly shows. And the one study which was done in preeclampsia patients to predict AKI said NGAL was useless. And there are a lot of studies, now we look at, now everybody has got an EICU, electronic medical records, there are electronic alerting system, wherever the value goes up, kind of shows red or if gives you a marking, and then you would go back and say that, okay, these are the alert that has come to me and said that this fellows, these variables or the biomarkers are up, so should I do something about it? Because like I said, these are, these are products that are released after an event has happened. So most of them, they don't predict something in, in, in before, but then once they are done, once they're showing the, the, all the variating systems, the outcome's not changing. Neither is the, pre the patient going into AKI, you're not able to prevent, neither is the patient's mortality, you're not going to change. So this is the biggest problem there. All these electronic alert systems have been showing you the alerts, but then, Ultimately, you don't know what to do with them. And then patient actually deteriorates. So most biomarkers have their limitations, especially differenting sepsis and non-sepsis. That is because sepsis is the biggest killer as far as uh, intensivist is concerned. And then you do so many of these have their limitations. And then because some of them are increased in other inflammatory uh, uh, considerations, and then the plasma markers, biomarkers are often shown to be more strongly related to disease severity than to the medic microbiology clinical disease. So just looking at some of the IL-6 will tell you that this host response is higher, but doesn't mean that the bacterial infection or a fungal infection or viral infection, what is that? So because IL-6 may be elevated even in COVID, non-COVID, any bacterial infection also, or atypical also, there's not much of a difference in the IL-6 that is produced. So IL-6 is produced in all infections. But because you don't expect, you're just looking at the inflammatory response in sepsis, that is what you're looking into, not the viral infection per se. So in that sense, all these biomarkers though you may be doing it, though you may be test trying to look at it, but they are not actually giving you any meaningful data to do. So that's the scope actually, biomarkers to be used only when doubt exists, despite sound judgment and traditional tools. So clinically examination would be something that I would rely more upon rather than relying on biomarkers. They should not be sent as a drop of the hat. It is something like sending a pan cultures when you know the patient has come with cough and hypoxia and fever. Sending a urine culture doesn't really m help you there but people send off urine culture because uh, once they have collected CU, it's easy to send the same sample out. So it is not the way that you deal medicine. You have to be, you have to use your clinical judgment, otherwise there is no special between. You either do a robot can sit there and send a panel of tests and then follow up the panel of tests. The ultimate idea is to look at these biomarkers and lose them sparingly where you think they really matter, they really make a a difference when there is some sort of suspicion. For example, in MI, you are suspecting whether you want to go with an MI ischemia, new ECG, change, old ECG changes in angina or other chest pain, 
may be the troponin i may help you there to understand whether yeah this is an acute mi or it's a rising trop i so probably you take him for intervention so these are some subset of pa patients or some subset of conditions where you may use them use them less use them sparingly not like the not like one you know just send off a panels to identify what's so. thank doctors so yeah over to you sir now i request dr suvir suresh ram subban sir for uh, how he will support and justify by doing all these biomarkers in clinical practice right um the topic is actually less is more as far as biomarkers are concerned so this so i'm going to um uh, speak and why we should do more biomarkers and i'm obviously um i'm going to give you examples of that and we know that a biomarker is nothing it's basically a biological marker so that's a short form is biomarker and it is defined as a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated so that means even your blood pressure is a biomarker so there's no need to measure blood pressure would be the automatic thing but yes so but just for the clarity term we don't want to measure pulse and blood pressure as a because it's a biological marker uh, so we don't want to say it's a pathogenic process so we don't we don't we're not saying so let's define it even a little better so quantifiable medical science modern laboratory science allows us to measure reproducibility so i'm not going to leave and say oh why measure blood pressure he is obviously in shock dr sab knows why even bother measuring a blood pressure sure don't bother i know he is dying i know he is dead so there's no point in measuring so let's not go to that debate we'll go to the debate of should we measure some laboratory values and should we do a lot of them or should we do less of them or should we just be a very pointed so they can be a, a to be or not to be all right and biomarkers i think uh, we have looked at all the negatives but how many of you there are many female angelina jolie being one of them so if you have a brca2 gene she has un undergone a prophylactic mastectomy based on a biomarker oh do you think you have the courage to believe in that or no false positive let me have that so no so oncologists don't believe in that so i don't think it is right so to say that biomarkers are imperfect and biomarker panels for cancers are well off you can say angelina jolie is uh, off the hooks and she is completely mad and cuckoo that might be possible but majority of the people you can talk to a lot of oncologists they will make their treatment decisions your prostate cancer treatment you uh, titrate your drugs to psa levels you do all these things your your oncology business will go to uh, complete kaput just because we live in a narrow cocoon of being critical care specialist uh, we just can't uh, ignore biomarkers we just have to say that we have imperfect biomarkers a blood group you give transfusion without a blood group try doing that i can sense that uh, dr pawanreddy is b positive because he's so positive am i right should i give him b positive blood i am right i'm going to be right 60% of the time because 60% of india is b positive so should good luck i shouldn't be testing a biomarker i shouldn't be testing any of these things so i shouldn't be treating glevec looking at cmr bcl uh, bcl abr gene it's a useless thing why did we even do these things these are biomarkers of no consequences so i think there is uh, i think the idea is uh, completely wrong to say that uh, uh, the these things should not be uh, measured or should not be this is absolutely wrong yes we are we have defined this an ideal biomarker and we know find that we cannot have something which is going to be good sensitive and specificity and that's our problem in critical care so our problem is to look at an imperfect thing in a imperfect world and that's where we are coming to the second concept is less is more to have an architect design this kind of a house is 100 times more expensive than to have a cluttered with a showcase and a tv cabinet separately and wires going through if you do this kind of concealed lighting on the ceiling it will cost you 10 crore rupees so believe me less is not more it's aesthetics so where did this concept of less is more it's attributed to shakespeare but uh, it's a modern as architectural concept less is more uh, the concept of minimalistic you know more is not good yeah i would like to after i am featured on the uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous even i can say money is useless but first feature me on lifestyles on the rich and famous on mtv with uh, you know uh, all the things that come good i will say money is bad but so minimalistic attitude and all these kind of things are very good but this is expensive to build a house like this is expensive so less is generally not more it is an artistic and an aesthetic concept to apply that to medicine 
Yes, if you believe that medicine is an art and not a science, yes, uh, please do that. But majority of us would believe that it is a science and we would tend to use that. In medicine, less is more is defined as uh, documenting ways that overuse and waste doesn't happen. So like op giving a urine analysis routinely, as he rightly mentioned, daily chest x-rays in the ICUs, there's no point in doing that. So these are all uh, you know, troponin testing when you have somebody has a coffee, have 10 coffees here and you get an SVT, go ahead, what's the point in doing a troponin test? You know why you had, to, uh, you had too much caffeine sitting in this hall. So don't drink coffee. So, so that's so exactly. So there is a concept of decrease, decreasing medical waste and th that is why this concept of less is more has come into the ICU. But less is more as compared to biomarkers, I beg to differ. So there are three kinds of doctors. There's a doctor called locomotive doctor who has an IQ of 35. That means they are, you know, required, you know that 35 is the minimum IQ required to wash your ass. That's the amount of skill that is required to wash yourself after you pass, go to the toilet. So 35. And then there are 180 plus. So like Dr. Pawan or Dr. Bidan Chandra, he is the first chief minister of West Bengal. You could walk into his room, he could smell and tell you you have heart failure. So there are doctors and majority of people like me are the 80 to 90 IQ who require when you have a case like this 66 year old male with history of hypertension admitted to the ICU with three hours of shortness of breath examination reveals no pallor chest with crackles tachycardia tachypnea blood pressure is slightly high no S3 no JVD no clinical DVT and then uh, what is the diagnosis how many of you would order a SOB panel here of biomarkers shortness of breath. <laughs> I left it to you for to understand, but how many of us would require assistance in this situation? Yes, I understand. So what is the, okay, as I said, Dr. Pawan is an extremely great clinician. He is Bidan Chandra Bose's direct de de descendant. If you look at the diag sensitivity and specificity of the cardiac S3 in the ICU, You're miserable. You know, you look at these, uh, how accurate is the assessment of JVP in an ICU, miserable. So are you going to trust this or are you going to have a thing? So the clinical heart failure, the example that uh, Dr. Pawan gave is very valid. If it's a bond or heart failure, we agree with it. We don't want you to do uh, any biomarkers in this. Go ahead and give the Lasix. I am not disagreeing. But the majority of us won't be able to discern an S3. The majority of us won't be able to see a JVD. And the majority of us are average people who can just wash their asses and go to work and come back home. So we are normal average doctors. When we talk about average doctors treating patients, it's a completely different world. That's a real world. So minimalistic is for people who are very smart, who are overtly intelligent. So I don't believe that minimalistic is good for us. At the same time, what we need to do is we need to understand this, that there's an empiric treatment of heart failure, this PE. So we really need to have some focus. So this is what is called as a bioscore. So that means you use the concept, what I will agree with my uh, worthy opponent here is the fact that it is a combination of using biomarkers and clinical variables to enhance diagnosis. And less is more is not a concept here in a kind of a vague scenario where this could be heart failure, this could be pulmonary embolism, this could be a little COVID lurking. If you do a CT, you would find it. You really don't know what's happening. So you really require biomarkers in this situation. So there is no way that there are clinical, clinical pictures are not very, very clear. And the example of a swan gans is a classical example. Swan gans, when you revisit in 2021, it gives you information. How you use it depends on what, what the operator is. So just because the IQ levels of physicians vary and the IQ level of users vary doesn't mean that the instrument is bad. So we don't blame the instrument, don't blame a tool for, uh, for our faults. So if you look at the procalcitonin, CRP, in sepsis, in community acquired, and I agree with you. So there is no doubt that this is not a tool that we need to talk about. This is not a tool. We don't have a perfect biomarker for our profession, for intensive care unit, but for heart failure, for uh, MI, non-STEMI. How can you do without a troponin? The definition includes the presence of a troponin. So you cannot diagnose NSTEMI without a troponin. So there is no question of having a CPK. So there is no question. So would you do a combination of HS tropi and CPK MB and or only do CPK? Less is more. Only do CPK MB or oh, renal failure. So I will not do troponin. I no, you do it. So less is not more in most of the situation. That's exactly the message that I want to. The single biomarker, as you can see, is going to be insufficient. So what you're going to look at is again as a combination of CRP to say whether it's inflammatory. You want to look at a combination of newer things that is going to come up. So the application of biomarkers for diagnosis, risk stratification, molecular phenotyping, and as Pawan pointed out in his ARDS lecture, that you really have to personalize it by looking at a lot of things. So less is not more in the ICU. 
especially true for biomarkers. We right now can say with confidence that in sepsis, in VAP, in HAP, in all the data that he presented, agree with you, there is no biomarker. So let us talk about that there is no good biomarker available. That is agreed, but doesn't mean that less is more, so you don't do anything at all, you don't do research, you don't look at it. So less is not more. So all the faults is not, res it results from living in an imperfect world of biomarkers and not the biomarker itself. And remember, a test by itself never cures anything, and good workmen never complain about their tools. You don't say Swangans is bad. And that's, I interviewed with Dr. Mitchell in uh, uh, University of uh, Virginia, and I really didn't want to join that fellowship because of the negative attitude. You can't blame a tool for uh, Connor, Mitchell Connor, uh, for uh, swan gans and uh, this thing. So you don't complain ki the saw was not good, so therefore uh, the wood is the carpentry is bad. You are a bad carpenter. So we are bad doctors if we don't know how to use our tools, if we don't know how to use it. So just to blame a biomarker and saying, oh, we should do less of it, we should do is not right. And I like this statement. Emma Watson, my idea of sexy is that less is more, the less you reveal, the more people you can wonder. Isn't it true? Sure. But uh, you don't want into wonder in a patient who's lying and dying in front of you. I can wonder how sexy or how bad the patient is. No, I want to be sure that there is something wrong with this patient. So I would have more rather than less. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Pawan. Will you agree for this bio scores are uh, right enough to do uh, justifying your uh, uh, diagnosis and the treatment? So al already Dr. Ram is uh, debating the point that caffeine causes SVT. <laughs> it only makes you run faster. Look at uh, Dr. Ram. He's done his marathons more. So yeah, I think, see, the, the concept is not that you don't do biomarkers at all or you don't do anything like even TLC you know TLC even leukocytosis is a biomarker or blood pressure is a biomarker it doesn't mean that what I'm saying is less do do less don't send panels and panels together don't uh, do hundreds of them like I show you a list of for delirium you want to do 20 panels to establish the patient as delirium uh, that doesn't really matter I mean that is not something that how you go about doing things it's basically that's what I'm saying Yes, tool should not be blamed, but at the same time, you, you whatever, if you're not good at it, how many amount of tools you get, you end up going to do, uh, probably I am still on that IQ levels where I can smell the IQ fellow of somebody with 30. <laughs> but the question is, yeah, you, you're not able to go about and do all these panels. You should not be doing hundreds of panels just to establish a diagnosis until unless you're going to do something about it. Sir, olden days, at, uh, olden, uh, our teachers, cardiologists or physicians, olden physicians, they used to examine very uh, clearly and uh, they check the JVP is raised and uh, S3 galloprism is there <coughs> or all the murmurs they could identify. But nowadays they are blaming the new generation uh, intensivist or doctors that they are not uh, doing the clinical examination properly and they are doing depends all in these all these panels are biomarkers so you, both of you come to one conclusion and uh, give one information to the sir
think the concept that Sir is also trying to mention is that it has to be focused and you have to find out what is actually worth. So I agree fully, don't waste 7,000 rupees on a pro cash drone when you're anyway going to be start anti -working. Don't waste pro cash drone when you're anyway not going to stop the anti -working. So don't bother. I agree with uh, that as a message to go through, but I don't believe less is more in a medical yes, sir. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. We will close the session. Thank you, sir. All these electronic alert systems have been showing you the alerts, but then ultimately you don't know what to do with them. And then patient actually deteriorates. So most biomarkers have their limitations, especially differentiating sepsis and non-sepsis. That is because sepsis is the biggest killer as far as uh, intense sepsis is concerned. And then so many of these have their limitations. And then because some of them are increased in other inflammatory considerations, and then the plasma markers, markers are often shown to be more strongly related to disease severity than to the medic microbiology clinical disease. So just looking at some of the IL-6 will tell you that the host response is higher, but doesn't mean that the bacterial infection or a fungal infection or viral infection, what is that? So because IL-6 may be elevated even in COVID, non-COVID, any bacterial infection also or atypical also, there is not much of a difference in the IL-6 that is produced. So IL-6 is produced in all infections. But because you don't expect, you're just looking at the inflammatory response in sepsis, that is what you're looking into, not the viral infection per se. So in that sense, all these biomarkers, though you may be doing it, though you may be test trying to look at it, but they are not actually giving you any meaningful data to do. So that's the scope actually, biomarkers to be used only when doubt exists, despite sound judgment and traditional tools. So clinically examination would be something that I would rely more upon rather than relying on biomarkers. They should not be sent as a drop of the hat. It is something like sending a pan cultures when you know the patient has come with cough and hypoxia and fever. Sending a urine culture doesn't really help you there. But people send off urine culture because uh, once they have collected CU, it's easy to send the same sample out. So it is not the way that you deal medicine. You have to be, you have to use your clinical judgment. Otherwise, there is no special between. You either do a robot can sit there and send a panel of tests and then follow up the panel of tests. The ultimate idea is to look at these biomarkers and lose them sparingly where you think they really matter, they really make a, a difference when there is some sort of suspicion. For example, in MI, you are suspecting whether you want to go with an MI ischemia, new ECG, change, old ECG changes in angina or other chest pain. Maybe the troponin I may help you there to understand whether, yeah, this is an acute MI or it's a rising tropi. So probably you take him for intervention. So these are some subset of patients or some subset of conditions where you may use them. Use them less, use them sparingly, not like the, not like one, you know, just send off a panels to identify what's done. Thank doctors. So yeah, over to you, sir. Now I request Dr. Suresh Ram Subban, sir, for uh, how he will support and justify by doing all these biomarkers in clinical practice? Um, the topic is actually less is more as far as biomarkers are concerned. So, this so I'm gonna um, uh, speak on why we should do more biomarkers and I'm obviously um, I'm gonna give you examples of that and we know that a biomarker is nothing, it's basically a biological marker so that's a short form is biomarker and it is defined as a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated. So that means even your blood pressure is a biomarker. So there's no need to measure blood pressure would be the automatic thing. But yes, so but just for the clarity term, we don't want to measure pulse and blood pressure as a, because it's a biological marker. Uh, so we don't want to say it's a pathogenic process. So we don't, we don't, we're not saying. So let's define it even a little better. So quantifiable medical science, modern laboratory science allows us to measure reproducibility. So I'm not going to leave and say, oh, why measure blood pressure? He's obviously in shock. Dr. Sab knows why even bother measuring a blood pressure. Sure, don't bother. I know he's dying. I know he's dead. So there's no point in measuring. So let's not go to that debate. We'll go to the debate of should we measure some laboratory values and should we do a lot of them or should we do less of them or should we just be uh, very pointed? So they can be a, a to be or not to be. All right, and biomarkers, I think uh, we have looked at all the negatives, but how many of you, there are many female, Angelina Jolie being one of them. So if you have a BRCA2 gene, she has un undergone a prophylactic mastectomy based on a biomarker. Oh, do you think you have the courage to believe in that or no, false positive, let me have that. So no, so oncologists don't believe in that. So I don't think it is right. So to say that biomarkers are imperfect. 
and biomarker panels for cancers are well off. You can say Angelina Jolie is uh, off the hooks and she is completely mad and cuckoo. That might be possible, but majority of the people, you can talk to a lot of oncologists, they will make their treatment decisions. Your prostate cancer treatment, you uh, titrate your drugs to PSA levels. You do all these things. Your, your oncology business will go to uh, complete kaput. Just because we live in a narrow cocoon of being critical care specialists, uh, we just can't uh, ignore biomarkers. We just have to say that we have imperfect biomarkers. A blood group, you give transfusion without a blood group? Try doing that. I can sense that uh, Dr. Pavanadi is B positive because he's so positive. Am I right? Should I give him B positive blood? I'm right. I'm going to be right 60% of the time because 60% of India is B positive. So should, good luck, I shouldn't be testing a biomarker. I shouldn't be testing any of these things. So I shouldn't be treating Gleevec looking at CMR, BCL, uh, BCL, ABR gene. It's a useless thing. Why did we even do these things? These are biomarkers of no consequences. So I think there is, uh, I think the idea is uh, completely wrong to say that uh, uh, the, these things should not be uh, measured or should not be, this is absolutely wrong. Yes, we are, we have defined this as an ideal biomarker. And we know fine that we cannot have something which is going to be good, sensitive, and specificity. And that's our problem in critical care. So our problem is to look at an imperfect thing in an imperfect world. And that's where we are coming to. The second concept is less is more. To have an architect design this kind of a house is 100 times more expensive than to have a cluttered with a showcase and a TV cabinet separately and wires going through. If you do these kind of concealed lighting on the ceiling, it will cost you 10 crore rupees. So believe me, less is not more. It's aesthetics. So where did this concept of less is more? It's attributed to Shakespeare, but uh, it's a modern as architectural concept, less is more. Uh, the concept of minimalistic, you know, m m more is not good. Yeah, I would like to, after I am featured on the uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous, even I can say money is useless. But first feature me on lifestyles of the rich and famous on MTV with, uh, you know, uh, all the things that come good, I will say money is bad. But so minimalistic attitude and all these kind of things are very good, but this is expensive. To build a house like this is expensive. So less is generally not more. It is an artistic and an aesthetic concept. To apply that to medicine, yes, if you believe that medicine is an art and not a science, yes, uh, please do that. But majority of us would believe that it is a science and we would tend to use that. In medicine, less is more is defined as uh, documenting ways that overuse and waste doesn't happen. So like op giving a urine analysis routinely, as he rightly mentioned, daily chest x-rays in the ICUs, there's no point in doing that. So these are all uh, you know, troponin testing when you have somebody has a coffee, have 10 coffees here and you get an SVT, go ahead, what's the point in doing a troponin test? You know why you had, to, uh, you had too much caffeine sitting in this hall. So don't drink coffee. So, so that's so exactly. So there is a concept of decrease, decreasing medical waste and the, that is why this concept of less is more has come into the ICU. But less is more as compared to biomarkers, I beg to differ. So there are three kinds of doctors. There's a doctor called locomotive doctor who has an IQ of 35. That means they are, you know, required, you know that 35 is the minimum IQ required to wash your ass. That's the amount of skill that is required to wash yourself after you pa go to the toilet. So 35. And then there are 180 plus. So like Dr. Pawan or Dr. Bidan Chandra, he's the first chief minister of West Bengal. You could walk into his room, he could smell and tell you you have heart failure. So there are doctors, and majority of people like me are the 80 to 90 IQ who require, when you have a case like this, 66 year old male with history of hypertension, admitted to the ICU with three hours of shortness of breath, examination reveals no pallor, chest with crackles, tachycardia, tachypnea, blood pressure is slightly high, no S3, no JVD, no clinical DVT, and then uh, what is the diagnosis? How many of you would order a SOB panel here of biomarkers? Shortness of breath. <laughs> I left it to you for to understand. But how many of us would require assistance in this situation? Yes, I understand. So what is the, okay, as I said, Dr. Pawan is an extremely great clinician. He is Bidan Chandra Bose's direct descendant. If you look at the diag sensitivity and specificity of the cardiac S3 in the ICU. Miserable. You know, you look at these, uh, how accurate is the assessment of JVP in an ICU. Miserable. So are you going to trust this or are you going to have a thing? So the clinical heart failure, the example that uh, Dr. Pawan gave is very valid. If it's a barn door heart failure, we agree with it. We don't want you to do uh, any biomarkers in this. Go ahead and give the LASIKs. I am not disagreeing. But the majority of us won't be able to discern an S3 
the majority of us won't be able to see a JVD, and the majority of us are average people who can just wash their asses and go to work and come back home. So we are normal average doctors. When we talk about average doctors treating patients, it's a completely different world. That's a real world. So minimalistic is for people who are very smart, who are overtly intelligent. So I don't believe that minimalistic is good for us. At the same time, what we need to do is we need to understand this, that there's an empiric treatment of heart failure is this PE. So we really need to have some focus. So this is what is called as a bioscore. So that means you use the concept, what I will agree with my op worthy opponent here, is the fact that it is a combination of using biomarkers and clinical variables to enhance diagnosis. And less is more is not a concept here in a kind of a vague scenario where this could be heart failure, this could be pulmonary embolism, this could be a little COVID lurking. If you do a CT, you would find it. You really don't know what's happening. So you really require biomarkers in this situation. So there is no way that there are clinical, clinical pictures are not very, very clear. And the example of a swan gans is a classical example. Swan gans, when you revisit in 2021, it gives you information. How you use it depends on what, what the operator is. So just because the IQ levels of physicians vary and the IQ level of users vary doesn't mean that the instrument is bad. So we don't blame the instrument, don't blame a tool for, uh, for you, our faults. So if you look at the procalcitonin, CRP, in sepsis, in community acquired, and I agree with you. So there is no doubt that this is not a tool that we need to talk about. This is not a tool. We don't have a perfect biomarker for our profession, for intensive care unit, but for heart failure, for uh, MI, non-STEMI. How can you do without a troponin? The definition includes the presence of a troponin. So you cannot diagnose NSTEMI without a troponin. So there is no question of having a CPK. So there is no question. So would you do a combination of HS tropi and CPK MB and or only do CPK? Less is more. Only do CPK MB or renal failure. So I will not do troponin. I no, you do it. So less is not more in most of the situation. That's exactly the message that I want to. The single biomarker, as you can see, is going to be insufficient. So what you're going to look at is again as a combination of CRP to say whether it's inflammatory. You want to look at a combination of newer things that is going to come up. So the application of biomarkers for diagnosis, risk stratification, molecular phenotyping, and as Pawan pointed out in his ARDS lecture, that you really have to personalize it by looking at a lot of things. So less is not more in the ICU, especially true for biomarkers. We right now can say with confidence that in sepsis, in VAP, in HAP, in all the data that he presented, agree with you, there is no biomarker. So let us talk about that there is no good biomarker available. That is agreed, but doesn't mean that less is more so you don't do anything at all, you don't do research, you don't look at it. So less is not more. So all the faults is not, it results from living in an imperfect world of biomarkers and not the biomarker itself. And remember a test by itself never anything. And good workmen never complain about their tools. You don't say swan gans is bad. And that's, I interviewed with Dr. Mitchell in uh, uh, University of uh, Virginia. And I really didn't want to join that fellowship because of the negative attitude. You can't blame a tool for uh, Connor, Mitchell Connor, uh, for uh, swan gans and uh, this thing. So you don't complain ki the saw was not good, so therefore uh, the wood is the carpentry is bad. You are a bad carpenter. So we are bad doctors if we don't know how to use our tools, if we don't know how to use it. So just to blame a biomarker and saying, oh, we should do less of it, we should do is not right. And I like this statement. Emma Watson, my idea of sexy is that less is more, the less you reveal, the more people you can wonder. Isn't it true? Sure. But uh, you don't want in to wonder in a patient who's lying and dying in front of you. I can wonder how sexy or how bad the patient is. No, I want to be sure that there is something wrong with this patient. So I would have more rather than less. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Pawan, uh, will you agree for this bio scores are uh, right enough to do uh, justifying your uh, uh, diagnosis and the treatment? So al already Dr. Ram is uh, debating the point that caffeine causes SVT. <laughs> it only makes you run faster. Look at uh, Dr. Ram. He's done his marathons more. So, yeah, I think, see, the, the concept is not that uh, you don't do biomarkers at all or you don't do anything, like even TLC, you know, TLC, even leukocytosis is a biomarker or blood pressure is a biomarker. It doesn't mean that. What I'm saying is less, do, do less. Don't send panels and panels together. Don't uh, do hundreds of them. Like I show you a list of, for delirium, you want to do 20 panels to establish that the patient has delirium. 
uh, that doesn't really matter. I mean, that is not something that how you go about doing things. It's basically that's what I'm saying. Yes, tool should not be blamed, but at the same time, you, you whatever if you're not good at it, how many amount of tools you get, you end up going to do. Uh, probably I am still on that IQ levels where I can smell the IQ fellow of somebody with 30. But the question is, yeah, you, you're not able to go about and do all these panels. You should not be doing hundreds of panels just to establish a diagnosis until unless you're going to do something about it. Sir, olden days, sir, the, um, olden, um, our teachers, cardiologists or physicians, olden physicians, they used to examine very... Uh, clearly, and uh, they check the JVP is raised, and uh, S3 gallop prism is there, <coughs> or all the murmurs they could identify. But nowadays, they are blaming the new generation uh, intensivist or doctors that they are not uh, doing the clinical examination properly, and they are doing depends all in these all these panels or biomarkers. Sir. 